Hi everyone, this is the second part of the video series on the first time back trading strategy. Um, in the first video we basically discussed the basis of a, of a setup in terms of a supply demand FTB and an SR FTB and what we look for in terms of the arc like retrace and some basic logic as to why the first time back to a, to a zone represents the highest probability of the same supply demand imbalance that caused the initial breakouts still existing compared to price coming back say the second, third and fourth time where each time price comes back to an ST zone it is consuming supply demand. Okay, In this video we're going to talk about some more advanced concepts in terms of the logic behind why an FTB works in terms of order flow dynamics and we're going to build on the videos where I spoke about finding supply demand within SR zones and what, what supply demand caused the breakout of an SR zone and then the other video that spoke about finding decision points within SD zones across multiple time frames we're going to use those concepts in terms of in terms of establishing entries and deciding on stop loss placement okay and lastly we're going to talk about um, pairs the difference between majors crosses and exotics and non forex pairs time frames I look at and time of day and some of and the considerations around that okay so firstly this was a slide from the first video where we were talking about the basic logic behind the FTB setup which I just spoke about in terms of price each time it hits the supply demand zone it is consuming supply demand and therefore it holds to reason that the first time price comes back to a supply demand zone it has the highest probability of having that same supply demand imbalance again and being rejected away from a supply demand zone and remember when I'm talking about supply demand that an SR level is just a cluster of supply demand zones at a similar price okay now before we move on to the next step which is order flow dynamics and some more advanced reasoning behind why an FTB setup works I need to take a step back and think about mindset and how a professional trader thinks about things compared to a novice trader okay so a professional trader when he's looking to buy or sell is always looking to buy from a novice trader or sell to a novice trader okay compared to buying or selling from another professional trader okay so how can a professional trader know whether a novice is buying or selling a particular area? Okay, well you have to consider one: where is order flow concentration likely to be high? Okay, and for example, that could be support resistance areas, swing highs, swing lows. Okay, and how is a typical novice trader trading around these these significant order flow concentration areas? Okay, so for example if you want to consider a support resistance zone who is buying when price breaks through a support resistance zone who is selling when price comes back to a support resistance zone and where where are their stops like to be clustered okay and what you can do in terms of novice traders is you consider classes of market participants okay so example a breakout trader okay a trend trader okay a counter trend trader okay and because of the herd mentality in terms of how novice traders think collectively as a whole you can pretty much estimate where stops are likely to place above swing highs okay above SR zones okay so you can figure out where clusters of stops are placed and where clusters of certain types of orders are placed okay and you can use that to your advantage because you know you know the effects of the order flow within this within these order order concentrations and you know how price will move there and therefore you know where liquidity is likely to be concentrated okay it's easier to discuss that with some examples okay so we have some supply demand zones here imbalance out of balance strong breakout okay what happens when price moves above this support resistance zone here okay sellers who have been selling and who are continuing to sell when price comes back up to this resistance have stop losses clustered above these swing high points okay that's common sense that's how most people will place their stops so we know if these stops are hit they are essentially buy orders so we have a cluster 
of buy mark buy orders here. Okay, so what's that going to cause? That's going to cause a rush up in price. Okay. Okay, it's the same when price breaks below this support resistance. We have swing low points here within this stops. People that have been buying on the support are stops here below these swing swing low points. Okay, and because these are very well defined support support areas here and resistance areas here, we're going to have a high order flow concentration. Okay, so when price hits these stops, okay, these these stops from buy orders are going to be sell orders, okay? The opposite of buying is selling. So this is going to cause a rush down, okay? And you have to remember is in terms of why price moves, price moves to find liquidity, okay? When these stops are hit here, price will move up to find supply, okay? To find sell orders, okay? If these cluster of buy orders are, high, are, are, are higher than the cluster of sell orders, in terms of volume, then price will move up to the next price level, and it will keep moving until it finds sellers. Okay, and this is why we expect price to break out with a rush like high momentum rush, because we're always going to have a much higher order flow concentration in terms of buy orders here than sell orders. So all the sell orders get consumed, and price has to keep moving up until it can find enough sell orders to match those buy orders okay price always moves to find liquidity okay and it moves because demand exceeds supply of supply to mean supply exceeds demand so this is why I call it the breakout rush and why we see a high momentum move when price moves has a breakout from a very clear support resistance area or above swing high swing lows you get the rush because because the order flow concentration around that area is discussed okay so we move if we move on this onto an actual first time back setup we see we have the breakout rush sellers are setting at this resistance price breaks through therefore the stops which are buy orders are triggered price has the initial rush rush it now starts to move away. So who is caught on the wrong side of the market? Sellers who have been continuously selling at this this resistance. So you can say range traders, okay. But anyone who is continuously selling when price is hitting a resistance for the you know the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, however you want to count it, multiple times. Whereas professional trader, we know that the more times price hits a resistance. The weaker it is, is, it is potentially becoming because price is consuming the supply, the available supply at that resistance area. Therefore, it is very likely to get weaker. And we can see in this example, we have a a breakout pattern in itself in terms of weaker moves away from the resistance, which suggests that the resistance is getting weaker. So anyone caught on the wrong side on the market here is pretty much a novice trader because no professional is going to be selling at this resistance given this pattern and given the number of touches that have, it number of touches of the resistance. So a novice trader is going to be caught caught on the wrong side of the market. Some of the stops will get tri triggered and that's what causes a rush. But there will be there will be sellers who will be holding on. Okay, novice traders don't tend to cut losses, they tend to move stops wider and tend to tend to believe that price will come back and just trade in hope, okay? So novice traders are going to be caught on the wrong side of the market here and they're going to be looking to bail as soon as price comes back to near break even, okay? So when price comes back here, what is the order flow concentration here and who are the participant classes of market participants, okay? Well, sellers who are already short below the breakout level have been caught on the wrong side and, been, and sweat, sweating it out because price has been moving away against them continuously now it's starting to come back they just want to get out okay so a break-even result is is considered a great result for a novice trader who's been caught on the wrong side of the market and seen price go um, strongly against them okay they just want to get out that's kind of the psychology behind you know, in terms of the mindset in terms of if price goes far against you and it comes back and you see you've been thousands or whatever in drawdown and it comes back to any break even you see that as an opportunity to get out and having suffered a lot of pain just get out as quickly as possible okay and also the way a novice trader works is, as I said, in terms of losses, they don't tend to cut losses short. The same, the opposite happens with winners. And as soon as price goes into a small profit, 
and doesn't continuously shoot shoot in their favour, they tend to cut winners far too quickly. A novice trader generally has a profile in terms of their win rate is half decent, but they let their average loser is much higher than their average winner. Okay. So sellers who are short are looking to bail. Okay, as close to break even as possible. Buyers who miss the initial breakout see this as an opportunity to get back in. This will be even more so if we have an underlying strong trend here, especially if it's a high time frame trend. Buyers will be seeing this as an opportunity to get into a trend at a discount, okay, compared to price being up here. Okay. Sellers who sold from above, from up here, obviously price has moved down, so there has to be some strong selling involved for price to move down. Sellers who sold when price started to move down are now in profit and will be targeting the support resistance as an area to take profit. Okay, Anyone who sold here will clearly see this support resistance, any technical trader, and will see that as an opportunity to take profit. Okay, So that's in terms of who is participating. Next you need to think out, think about what type of order flow do they represent. Okay, Sellers who were short and are caught on the wrong side of the market are going to be buying. They'll be taking profit and therefore they're going to be buying. Okay, Buyers who missed the initial breakout are going to be buying, obviously. Sellers who are in profit and looking to take profit are going to be buying. Okay, And also, lastly, buyers who bought on the breakout and were involved in this breakout rush as well as the seller stop losses that got triggered will also have most likely have set break-evens. Okay, moving stop loss to break even, etc. That is a very common practice, rightly or wrongly, amongst traders, and thus there will be a break, a series of breakout, break even type of orders here, from buy orders, and therefore that's a sell order. Okay, if you're buying here and you've set your stop loss to break even, the opposite of buying is selling. And therefore, that there will be some sell orders clustered within this range, as buyers have started, breakout traders are starting to get involved. Okay, but so you can see the main market participants that we know are going to be participating at this area are buying. Okay, you've essentially got a three to one ratio here. It's, okay, that doesn't mean there's going to be every set order is going to be three three buy orders. It's certainly not the case, but the vast majority of market participants participating at this area have buy orders. Okay, so the order flow concentration is is, is are buy orders. Okay, and that is pretty much an advanced order flow based reasoning why the FTB setup works. Now the last thing to look at is what happens in this space here, okay? Because what we will typically typically see when price cons approaches the SR that's the, the basis of our FTB entry is price will move down with good momentum into that. Okay, it will have the opposite of the rush that caused the initial breakout back into this area. Okay, now it's important to understand that's something we want to look for, and obviously the confidence that leads to appreciating that something we want to look for is understanding why that might be the case. Okay, there's more than one reason. The first one is the break-even orders I mentioned before from the breakout traders here, who've got involved in in this area here and they've set their stop loss to break even, that is going to cause a cluster of sell orders down into hit, down this in this area, okay? Another reason is when price broke above this area, it flushed out all the orders. Okay, there was a cluster of sell orders, either stop losses from sellers, the, sorry, a cluster of buy orders, the stop losses from sellers, and those that order, because price moves with good momentum, it flushes out the order flow concentration within this area. Therefore we have a liquidity vacuum of sorts. Okay, It's not a pure liquidity vacuum but potentially we have a, a, a partial liquidity vacuum. And what does that mean? That means the order flow concentration within this area is very light and therefore price moves through it very easily to find liquidity. Okay, If you remember price is always moving to find liquidity. Okay, If there is no buy orders within this area but there is sell orders then price will move down very quickly until it can find buy orders. Okay. And the last potential reason, which probably won't be the case too much in this, on, on this one, but um, sometimes you'll see a support level form 
not far above the main FTB support level and obviously if this area if there's a strong support area here and price breaks below it you're going to have the same breakout rush which happens here but in the opposite direction okay so it's important to remember that we do expect a good momentum move into our FTB area okay and because of the order flow concentration here we expect a strong move away okay okay so it's not typically novice trader will be scared of price moving fast against them okay but it's important to realize it's not something to be scared of and it's something to embrace and something we fully expect and I've explained why okay and I'm not talking about price moving 100 miles an hour from up here I'm talking about price moving fast as it gets very close to our FTB entry area okay and I've got some examples of this Oh, first of all, just a summary. It's just a summary of, of, of what I said. Let's go back and um, where we are so far in terms of video one and where we are with video two so far. We have a significant supply demand imbalance, i.e., a strong breakout, a strong clear breakout. We have space between that breakout and first return, the arc. We then expect with high probability price move with good momentum when it gets close to our SDSR zone and then good momentum away in terms of reaction away from our SDSR zone, okay? And I explained the order flow dynamics as as to why this works in terms of market participants and the order flows they represent, okay? Now that's not the only way you can use that kind of knowledge in terms of market participants and order flow concentration. It's something to, it's, it's a kind of a mindset thing in terms of thinking who is participating, what order flow do they represent, how does that suggest price will move, how, how is a professional going to take advantage of the knowledge in terms of, the, when I talk about a professional, I'm talking about an institution player who can move the market, how are they going to take advantage of the order flow concentration that they know is very likely there, okay? That can be used in more strategies than just the FTB strategy. Okay, so examples of FTBs are more focused on the good momentum move into our FTB and the momentum move away. Okay, see here, this is a clear SR, this is silver. The arc price comes back, and you see it moves down very quickly, and on the same bar reverses very quickly. Okay, this one's pound yen, another SR FTB, very clear SR, price comes back. And you see, as soon as it moves again above this clear resistance, we have that order flow concentration, we have buyers causing the rush, but then as you can see, we price is instantly reversed. Okay. Next one, this is Kiwi dollar, and this is a rally based rally. FTB and ST zone FTB and again you can see price is moving down fairly slowly you know, chopping around but as soon as we get close you can see that when we break from up here and then when we break this area here price moves with very good momentum and again it is instantly instantly reversed last example this is really best drop this is uh, euro pound clear ST zone, clear strong breakout, arc like return and again you see when price moves above this this base that has formed we have a very strong move in and a very strong move away okay so hopefully that will give you confidence to not get scared when price is moving with good momentum into our FTB area okay because it's exactly what we look for it doesn't mean we get it every single time and doesn't mean if it doesn't happen we shouldn't be in a trade, okay? But this is what we typically expect from an FTB setup, okay? In terms of how price moves when it gets close to the area and how price gets rejected, okay? And as I said, it doesn't mean price will always do this. Sometimes it will hang around for a while before getting rejected, okay? It won't always happen in the same ways, but more often than not, this is how an FTB setup works, okay? And how it will look when you look over your charts, okay? So something just to bear in mind. Okay, what I'm going to do now is look at entries and stops. I'm going to use those same four examples in a minute, but just to go over the basis of how we find entries and stops. And again, you know, this is discussed. This is using concepts I've already already got been over 
in my other videos which I mentioned at the start of this video okay, in terms of finding finding supply demand within support resistance zones and then finding decision points using multi time frame analysis within supply demands zone themselves okay so basically our entries are going to go at the first possible decision point where price is likely to find supply demand on that on the retrace okay stops are going to go beyond a logical decision point or source of the initial supply demand okay if it's an SR zone it's more likely to be the source if it's a supply demand zone supply demand zone with substance um, it's more likely to be a decision point rather than the source we have to always bear in mind with a an FTB setup that we don't expect price to make deep retracements beyond an SR zone or deep retracements beyond an SD into an SD zone okay on the FTB because it's the FTB we expect a quick rejection okay and it to reject price strongly and pretty much near near where our entry is okay we don't expect a deep move into a, a a substantial SD zone on the FTB okay because we expect that supply demand imbalance to be still very strong okay so we use that to our advantage when placing stops we place stops beyond logical decision points and not necessarily be far below the edge of the zone in terms of the source of the initial supply demand okay and stops are always placed with long-term expectancy in mind and not win rate okay a typical mistake a novice trader will make is they will look at swing low, swing highs in terms of where placing stops with compared to looking at the supply demand that caused the initial breakout and looking that to to hold on the retrace. They just look at wide ish swing low, swing highs or SRs and place stops 30, 40, 50 pips on a on, on, a, on a, a dollar major pair. And they are more focused on having winning trades than long-term expectancy. Long-term expectancy is a function of trade frequency, risk reward, average risk reward, and win rate. But novice traders are generally more focus on win rate than the other two, and that has a detrimental effect on your long-term profit. A professional trader, and myself included, only ever care about long-term expectancy and long -term, maximizing long-term account growth, okay? I long-term profit. Win rate is only a function of confidence, but I don't care if when win, win rate is 90% or 60%, I would do whatever will bring a long-term high expected expectancy, okay? Okay then, so I'm gonna look at the first one, which is silver. I'm gonna move fairly quickly over these. I appreciate this video is gonna be quite a long video, but I'm gonna move fairly quickly over these because I've already been over these concepts before. But I've, tip, I've chosen deliberately chosen examples which probably aren't the easiest ones you'll find in terms of find, determining stops. Okay, entries are, should be pretty straightforward but stop losses are, are where the difference is made in terms of risk reward and generally the harder the harder thing to, to look at. Okay, so it's an SRFTB, this is one hour time frame, one hour setup. So now I'm going to zoom in to find decision points, okay? So I'm going to go down to 15 minute time frame. Now, first of all, well, we can tell that this is going to be, this is the source. This is the source that led to the breakout, okay? But this source is far away from the support resistance zone. My stop loss is never, ever going to go below here because I do not expect a move down through this SR down to here and then a rejection, okay? And even if I did, then I'm not trading the SR. I'm trading this SR here. Therefore, I expect a reaction within the, within the close vicinity of this SR. On this pair, a move down this far is not trading at SR. Okay, if you're saying well, price could bounce here, well, it could, but it could also bounce here, move up to here, act as resistance now, and then move down here. But I'm not going to base my stop loss on the fact that price might move down here. Okay, I know that for a good FTB setup, price should not move materially or significantly beyond this SR. Okay, and certainly not on a pair like this in terms of average volatility of this pair not this far beyond the SR okay this SD zone is a separate setup maybe in itself but it's not a reason to be placing your stop loss below here okay you just all you're doing here is maximum well what you're doing here is slightly increasing your chances of winning trade and I say only slightly because I know that price shouldn't really go beyond you know, the close vicinity of this SR and most of the time it won't so therefore the times it does and holds this area and then moves back significantly above this area is going to be very low okay so you'll 
you're slightly increasing your chances of winning train, but you're drastically reducing your risk reward, and therefore you're drastically reducing your long-term profit potential, i.e. long-term expectancy, okay? So straight away when I look at this, I say, well, that's the source, okay? But my stop loss isn't going to go below, below there, but that's the source, okay? Now, we can see here that we've got an SR flip zone here, and we've got one here, okay? So they are decision points. So I want to zoom in further. If we go down to M5, we can see that when price had to break out, it came back and it tested this area here. Okay, so this is a definite decision point and it was previous resistance here and it's been an SR flip zone. And we can still clearly see this SR flip zone here. So that's another decision point. If we look at M1, pretty choppy, but we can see the, the clear decision point here and then we can still see this SR flip zone and we can see the source here. So my stop loss, the options are to put it below here, but the problem is if you put it below here, this this has already been tested, therefore some demand out of here has been consumed. So it is logical to think that maybe all the demand out of here has been consumed, so price has, quite feasibly might move down to here before bouncing. Of course it might not, it might still stay up here, but it could act at one of those three points. I don't expect price to move below here. Okay, and I don't expect it to move down below to, towards the source. So my stop loss is going to be placed below 33.10. I always use a slight buffer because nothing nothing turns on a on a pinpoint. So it's going to be a few pits below, say you know six seven. Okay. And where's my entry? It's the first possible place price might should meet demand or could meet demand. Okay. So it's going to be above this decision point here. Okay, or this one here. This one's slightly higher. This one's more recent, but I'm going to put it above here again. I use a little buffer, and obviously you add spread on on a buy order, so it's going to be let's say 33 plus spread, okay? And it's going to my stop loss is going to be say 307s, okay? And as we know, price reacted exactly at the first place it could and moved away. I'm not going to talk about target or exit; that's beyond the scope of this video, okay? So that's silver. Next one, let's look at, uh, yeah, let's look at Euro Pound. So H4 setup, ignore the lines at the moment. It'll become clear when I zoom in. H4, rally base drop, or if you can see the large time scale drop, base drop, doesn't really matter. It's just a supply demand zone, FTB setup. So I'm gonna zoom in. Now this one, I remember being a little trickier. Yeah, the reason why this one's trickier is because there's no obvious clear edge to the zone. Okay, and why by clear edge I mean if you if you look at say the top edge, that's much clearer because you've got multiple resistance, multiple touches of what is essentially a resistance which forms the edge of the edge of the supply demand zone. Okay, with the bottom edge we don't have that. We have we have a kind of support area there, but then more recently we have a a drop down to actually find this demand here, and then we have a higher drop. And then we have a drop and some swing low points here. So it's not clear, so therefore it doesn't make it easy for establish en entries. Okay, so if I zoom into M5, I can't go into M1 this far back in the past. No. Okay, so we have this this line here, this decision point here, we have this area here with this low here. We have all these lows here. I'm, I'm going to kind of ignore all these odd one lows here because it's very, very choppy. And this is this was a main swing low here in terms of how price reacted to it. Okay, these are all very choppy and not well defined. But what I do notice here is we have a drop base drop. Okay, this in itself is a drop base drop which led to the strong move down. Okay, this is the source obviously. This is should be pretty clear to see. This is the source of the move. Price moved away strongly from there. Obviously, I don't expect price to get back to there on the FTB in determining entry. Now you could easily say, and it's not certainly it's not wrong to say this, my price my entry is going to go below here. But I'm looking at this and I looked at this for quite a while and I thought, well, price clearly found supply here and this was what led to the strong move down. Okay. We had a move down, price moved back up, it found supply here. We have we know that this is a decision area here and we can see here and slight resistance here and support here. So I'm kind of thinking, well, my entry is most likely to go here. 
Okay, it's not wrong to put it there, but I think chance has a high price has a higher chance of actually finding su supply here rather than here, which is more of a minor decision point. Okay, but my stop loss is going to go above this drop, drop base drop. Okay, I don't expect price to move materially into here. Again, I'm going to use a, you know, you've got to use a buffer. You can see all these wicks here that price this week here, these ones here that price might move materially, not materially, but you can see how far price might move beyond an SR while still holding it. Okay, so the stop loss is going to probably be placed around 30s plus plus spread. Um, entry is going to be around say 22 or 21.5 euro pounds, so you need to consider uh, pit movements, one pit means quite a lot on a euro pound. Um, okay, so where did price go to the M30? So we can see when price actually reacted to. We can actually see that it actually did react at the top of that drop base drop. Okay, so my entry would have been around 22s to 21.5s, for example, and my stop, as I said, would be at sort of 30s plus spread, I think I said, but above that drop place drop drop base drop with a buffer okay and as you can see price did as expected it didn't go beyond there but it did act right at the top of it and then moved away okay next one pound yen okay so this was a h1 srftb we can see it here very clear so if we zoom in m30 M30 we can see, see we've got a decision point here, price had to break here, move lower, but the most recent decision point was was, was clearly here. Um, and we can also see the source or the drop was most likely around here, we see it's a clear SR, and we can see we have a, a clear SR flip zone around here too. So move down to M15, clearly see that the source was up here now, and we can clearly to see this is a decision point and here as well. M5. Now we can clearly see this support area, which met support here as well. It's more of a zone I've marked in others. The source again is clear. We can see price hit the top of this one here. Added to support, 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 support. Scrolling back, you can see resistance. It's kind of a a choppy little zone here. Now the hardest thing here is where am I going to put my entry? Is it going to be below here or is it going to be below here? There's no necessarily wrong reason or right reason for this. The most recent decision point is going to be more important to me than one in the past. But I'm going to bear in mind that you know price could and it does do this in terms of it, it, it does treat the past one and, and react here you know, I've had times when I've put my order here, for example, and price is actually below here and you miss out. So it comes down to user preference, essentially. I'm more often going to place it above the more recent one, below, or kind of midpoint between the two in terms of, I always use a buffer, so I'm going to say, well, you know, I, I expect it, I expect it's more likely to hit this one, but I'm going to put a buffer anyway. Uh, I'll put probably a bit more of a generous buffer to consider it might just go slightly beyond here and not quite reach the edge of this zone, okay? Scroll into M1. M1, we can clearly see the decision point here. We can clearly see, more importantly, this SR or S supply demand flip here, and especially here. See the source here, price had to come out beyond here. So I don't expect price to move beyond this area. So my stop is going to go just above the, you know, the edge of this zone. So, you know, say. 76, 77 plus spread. I'm entry is going to go. I'm going to put a generous buffer below here, say 59s, 59 or 60. And you see where pretty price react. If we zoom in, can't remember. Let me have a look. You see, first off, price reacted at the lower one. So if you were at the lower one, you would have got in. But then it did react pretty much to the pip at the higher one. So either one would have worked out. It just would have had a slightly increased stop loss size. And then obviously it moved away and moved away quite substantially on this one. Okay. Lastly, 
it's hopefully should be coming very clear in terms of the process to go through. Uh, Kiwi dollar, one hour, rally base rally, FTB. Let's zoom in. Let's go straight down. So, see, so anyway, when I mark up the zone, I'm going to put my zone below here and above here. Now I'm zooming in to refine it because I know my stop loss is never going to be placed below here because that's way beyond the kind of the edge of this zone. And as I said, I don't expect a deep retracement. Now this one definitely was tricky because the zone was caused, the breakout was caused through a, a, a news-based move. So if we go down to M5, so you can't see any of this on H1, you can see this was a news-based move. Price doesn't move like this normally on this pair. This was a news-based move and you can see it's created some very choppy price action. But straight away you can see the edge of the zone, this resistance or this high, and price tested it on the immediate retrace on, on M5 before moving away. So this is the first possible place price could find demand on the retrace. Now in terms of marking up decision points, this is clearly the source, but this is kind of a whipsaw low liquidity move. So I, I don't expect price to move anywhere near down here, but we can see we have a major decision point here. Okay. We're going to M1. And this one takes a lot of looking at, but you can see we have a resistance area along here. And we can see it found support here, resistance, support there, resistance, and then we had the move, quick move down to this decision point break up, come back again, low, low liquidity, create a spike, and move up again. And we can see we tested, we got rejected, price rejected here, here, and here within this zone here. And then lastly, we've got a clear resistance here, okay? So I would mark this as one big decision point zone, okay? And my stop loss is gonna go below it, okay? This is where my entry is gonna go, be based on going to be just above here with a buffer plus spread and my stop loss is going to go below this area a little bit of a buffer again say 31s 30s maybe probably more likely to be 31s and my entry is going to go say 40 44s plus spread and as you can see price actually on this one moved into that decision zone and again our stop loss below there would have been would have, would have kept us safe you can see how using tight stops but logical stops really maximizes your risk reward. Price might come two, three pips within your stop loss, but as long as you're maximizing your long term expectancy through maximizing your risk reward, that's the most efficient way of trading FTBs. Okay? Now I would see people play stops below here. That's just completely illogical. Price has a, such a low chance hitting there. Now it does happen, price might come down here and move away. But it's such a low chance of that happening and a low occurrence of that happening that it doesn't it doesn't make sense to do it over the long term. Because for every trade that it does that, you've probably got say five percent chance of it doing that, hitting there and then moving away and going to your target. So if that's a five percent chance of doing that, why do you want to be doing placing your stop loss when it's only a five percent chance of doing that where the other ninety five percent of winning trades is gonna a stop loss below here is gonna be a, it's gonna be sufficient, okay? Don't be affected by your your win rate. Focus on maximizing your risk reward, which in turn maximizes your long term profit potential and long term long term expectancy. Okay. Okay, just wrapping up now. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was pairs, time frames, and time of day. Now, I would trade any pair within reason, and any asset class within reason. But you've got to consider two things. You've got to consider liquidity and you've got to consider spread. Okay. If I'm trading M5 on something exotic, say, I don't know, um, dollar versus Mexican peso, or for example, I don't know, some exotic pair where the spread is quite high. When I'm trading M5 time frame, it's not going to make sense from a spread perspective, because the spread is going to be so high relative to your, your, your stop loss absolute size. Say you've got a stop loss of 10 pips and the spread's, you know, say 7 pips. That doesn't make sense because your cost of trade is so high from a percentage perspective, okay? The other thing to consider is liquidity. The more exotic a pair, the less liquid it is because the less people are trading it directly, okay? Think cross pairs and exotic pairs have their order flow resulting from direct order placement, i.e. euro into CAD, but also from their const 
from their individual elements. Okay, so Euro dollar, Canadian dollar affects Euro CAD. Okay. So you have to bear that in mind in terms of liquidity. And you can easily see that on chart. If I scroll into M1 on you know Euro Mexican Peso, it's going to be a complete mess. It's going to be unreadable compared to M1 on Euro dollar. Okay, because liquidity isn't there. So you get less liquidity means less order flow concentration, therefore the order flow reasoning behind an FTB has a lower chance of working out, and also you're more likely to get spikes, okay? So you're gonna get whipsaws and spikes, and you're more likely to get stopped out because price isn't gonna turn exactly where you expect it to, okay? So you've always gotta consider liquidity and spread. Spread is a cost of trade. And that determines whether I'm gonna trade a pair and also what time frame. So I'm more likely to consider higher time frames on less liquid pairs and a mixture of higher and lower time frames on more liquid pairs. Now I do trade exotics, I do trade crosses. I'm just more picky because of the liquidity and because I only can look at higher time frames because of spread and liquidity. Therefore I'm more likely to be more picky because I've only got a smaller sample of time frames to look over than on the majors, okay? And I'm more, more also going to be more cautious in terms of stops compared to on a dollar, say euro dollar, compared to a euro sec, for example, because because of what I said in terms of liquidity, if price doesn't have much liquidity, it means it's going to drop, it's going to have whipsaws, it's going to have spikes to find liquidity because there's no order flow concentration at a, a certain price level. Okay, so you've got to be more cautious on stops when you talk about crosses and exotics. Okay, than, than than the dollar and yen majors. Okay, so same with any other asset class. I would trade any other asset class because the order flow, because because the order flow dynamics behind an FTB setup is transferable to any asset class. Okay, but you just got to look at how liquid it is, and look at things like spread. Okay. Now, in terms of when am I going to trade and when am I not going to trade, we've talked about liquidity and that also transfers to trading sessions. Okay. The London trading session has the highest volume of forex transactions in the market. Okay, Asia has the lowest. Okay, New York is in between. Okay, I would trade any active trading session, but I'm going to be slightly more cautious over Asia. But I still do trade setups during Asia. But I'm going to be a lot more cautious at times between sessions, especially between New York close and Asia open. Okay. You think who actively trades between New York close? I mean, New York afternoon session is normally quite slow anyway. But new between New York close and Asia open, who trades in? Algos, you know, no one really actively trades in. So you think, well, there's going to be a lack of liquidity. If there's a lack of liquidity. There's the lack of the order flow concentration, the order flow dynamics that we want occurring. Therefore, I'm not going to trade, take a trade, or very rarely, I'm going to take a trade that's going to trigger during that market session, okay, or during the gap between sessions, okay. Another thing I don't I don't trade Sunday open. My my start of weeks is London open. Okay, liquidity is very low during the first Asian trading session of the week. Okay, and the last one is late on Friday. Okay, traders pack up on Friday. You don't go opening an FTB trade at 8 p.m. British summer time on a Friday. Okay, because liquidity is going to be low on the last trading session of the week. Okay. So it's just you've got to use your common sense in terms of liquidity, okay? In terms of when to trade, what to trade, what time frames to trade, and consider the spread as a cost to trade, okay? Okay, I appreciate that's been a particularly long video, and I've covered a lot of things in there. Um, there's going to be one more video, and then maybe a webinar, or maybe the last one will be a webinar. I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet. But um, the next things we need to go over is X6 exits okay in terms of trade management that's a more of a general topic as well but we need to, how do we decide decide FLI FLS's and how to exit how to hold a trade beyond the beyond the FLI FLS um, gonna look at lots of examples uh, that's probably where webinar might be handy um, and we also I also want to go over some obje objective considerations okay in terms of trading near news times, um, impulsive moves, okay, how price behaves when you've 
when it's triggered a trade in terms of if we don't get that liquidity spike essentially what it is you know the the, this, the quick move in momentum into the air and reversal if it doesn't have that if it starts basic basing but within you you know your supply demand or SR area is there a reason to cut a trade things like that is what I want to want to go over reasons to not take a trade reasons to hold on to trade reasons to maybe reduce exposure in a trade okay